So um, I'm going to again say welcome to folks. This is the, the Weird Church, or really the focus here is on transformational visioning. And I do want to point out there are no handouts that were part that came to you through the Whova app because everything actually is on the website. If you go to smeucc.org and were to go into the search box that you find there and simply type the word weird into it, uh, it will take you to a weird uh, or transformational visioning page on our website. On that website, you will find a recording of this material. It's about three years old. And if this recording comes out well, actually this recording will be on that website in its place. Uh, in addition, the PowerPoint that I'm using is on the website, so you don't need to worry about too much about taking notes. You can review the PowerPoint later. And there are a number of handouts that are linked on that web page. I'll refer to some of those, but you can look at those handouts as well. They're great resources for you to bring back to your church uh, for information on that. So just be aware that there are a lot of material that will be out there. Because there's a lot of information in this session, uh, this began as a one hour workshop. That was not enough time. We went to an hour and a half. That was not enough time. We went to the two and a half hour extended time. And I did this last week and got through only two thirds of the material. But I also did that intentionally. And I'll do it again intentionally. Because, because we're a good sized group here, it allows us a bit more conversation. And because the questions you're asking this morning, like the last group did, focus on the first part, you can review the second part later. The second part really gives you some examples of ways in which church are doing, churches are doing some innovative things. I'm not even sure I would call it churches. I would say it's ways in which the Holy Spirit of God is doing innovative work, uh, creating new ways of being communities of faith in the world. That's great to look at. But I, before you look at that, I want you to sort of get grounded in the material, which is what we'll do first. But it's a bit like drinking from a fire hose, one of my favorite illustrations. Uh, I will not apologize for that because the beauty is the PowerPoint and the video are available. You can go back and review all of this later if you want to uh, receive it, um, look at it more deeply. And because we are in the midst of this COVID pandemic, we are now nine months in, uh, and we are encountering a new surge of it, which means that we're adapting again to what we have to do as we as we almost get through one entire year of a church season in a pandemic world. Um, and at the same time, there's a cumulative level of exhaustion among us. So this is a really intriguing moment for that. So I will take some of the material we're using here and, and shift it a bit around some of the insights we're getting from COVID. I'm gonna share my screen and begin showing you the PowerPoint. You will also notice uh, that uh, Sue has placed in the chat box a link to the web pages, and, and as we talk about some materials, you'll see other links and information popping in there. Feel free to grab that information and write it down for you or cut and paste it if that would be helpful. So if you've uh, been to my presentations before, you will uh, there are certain things I share everywhere I go because I really, really like them. And this is the beginning again. The book I referenced there, Weird Church. There's a picture of it. It is by Beth Ann. I can't even read that. Uh, but Paul Nixon is also one of the authors of that. And we've begun our time with some of our uh, introductions. And again, part of my focus here is to bring you through five of the sort of foundational and fundamental and I think essential concepts in the understanding of how to get a church from where it is to where God wants it to be and how to travel between that distance from here to there. So there we are, five primary concepts in it. And one of those deals with this particular video. This individual is called Michael Jr. He's a comedian. He has his own website, webpage, and podcast. And this particular uh, uh, image, if you were to Google Michael Jr. Uh, and know your why, this will pop up. It's become a very popular video of his, and I'm going to let you watch it. So what did you see? What did you observe? What did you hear? Engagement. Mm -hmm. 
you could clearly see the connection that was made to, to the people who were hearing him sing. Yeah, his performance was much more vivid and clear once he knew his why, and that was really very attractive to all the folks around. Deeply engaging, powerfully moving. Uh, people were enjoying it. Not only were they enjoying it themselves, but they were actually interacting with each other in new ways. There's another person, I'm gonna go back to share screen. There is another individual who I typically would have used at this point called Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Uh, Simon Sinek uh, it has done a TED talk and I believe the TED talk is entitled How Great Leaders Inspire. But if you were to simply uh, Google Simon Sinek TED talk, most likely it will pop up because it is one of the most popular TED talks out there. And Simon Sinek, uh, shares the concept of getting to know your why. Jesus God. And he uses this image. Come on, go, be, go slowly for me. He uses this particular image and he says, people don't care what you do until they know why you do it. And so he talks about this concept here. Uh, and I, I will say often that in most of, so I, I have worked in the area of church growth and evangelism for about 40 years in some way, shape or form. And I'll say for most of the 40 years, the question raised around church growth, um, church revitalization, church energizing, church transformation, church revitalization uh, has all centered around one particular question. Uh, what do you think that question is? When people call in someone to do church growth, help us grow our church, what are they asking? What are they looking for? Any, any, any ideas? You all know the answer. Go ahead. Yeah. I bet they want to focus on the how. How do we grow? How do we change? What do we do? And, and they want to go there right away without going to the why. Exactly. The question is always some form of how do we get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate? And typically, they'll also share that we're, looking, we're focusing on young families as a piece of that. And the challenge of that is people don't really care what you do until they know why you do it. And if your driving force that energizes your congregation to move forward is to get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate, you are not likely to accomplish that because people don't want to come into the church to satisfy your needs, but they will be powerfully driven by your why. So if you're trying to transform your church, if you're trying to bring vitality into your church, the first thing you want to work on is to discover what your why is. And I put the heart in here because the why cannot come from the head. It has to come from the heart and it has to come from the heart in connection with God. And we use the language for the why. What are your core values, your beliefs, your identity and purpose? Now, all of that can come from the head, but if I want to discover a compelling why, a powerful why, I wanna go deeper than that. Um, in my experience, every church has a mission statement. Uh, most of those mission statements sound pretty generic. Uh, and most of the time, people can't quote to me what the mission statement is. And when they do, there's no energy behind their quoting. So when I'm looking to discover the why, I'm looking for people to say something back to me that, they, that I can hear in their voice is tapping into a deep enthusiasm and a deep passion. So it, it will also come from God. If it's truly a place of identity and purpose, I believe that comes out of your relationship with God and it comes out of a relationship with God that has been transformational for you. Uh, it is what energizes you in the congregation. It is life-giving and passion evoking. Uh, when you engage in doing the things around this, why time flies. Time goes by quickly for you and the congregation. I often find that the why has been true throughout the history of the church. Now, it may vary a bit from time to time. So I worked with one church and we were doing some work around, you know, what is our identity? What is our purpose? What is it that is passion evoking, life-giving for you? And they began talking about um, working with, with youth. 
not just getting more young families into the church, but working with youth, being a present to youth. As I dug into the history of that church, they were one of the first churches to have a, a scout troop. Uh, they were one of the first churches to have an educational system uh, in their church and in their community. They were instrumental in forming the town library for the education of children. And some of their previous pastors had served either on the local or the state board of education. Something in their DNA uh, that touched upon their why had been true throughout their history. It's not always the case, but I often find that I'm looking at the DNA as well as uh, if I find a life-giving piece, it also points to, a, to the history and DNA. But here's a key point. When you find your why, when your church finds its why, when everyone in the church can enthusiastically quote what they feel that why is, it is a kind of energy that will move you out of your comfort zone because you're drawn into wanting to bring that why to life in the world around you. Uh, who you are is defined by what you are willing to struggle for. So the why will take you into that place. It, it, again, I, I want to keep emphasizing the why is not an experience of analysis. We'll come back to that a little bit, little bit later. It is an experience at the level of heart and at the level of soul. Here's the second energy. Once you know what your why is, once you know what is your core identity, and while it may have certain commonalities with other churches, part of your why is something that only you can uniquely do or only you as a congregation are uniquely called to. Once you have that sense of your why, you're gonna to begin to craft for yourself a narrative or a story. What will the future look like three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, if our church truly stepped out of its comfort zone and authentically, deeply, passionately lived its why. So the why gives one piece of energy because it tells you who you are, where, what, what you want to be. The future story gives you the other piece of energy that will draw you forward into the future. And again, I've worked with, with groups and organizations that crafted a future story. It was pretty, it was nice, it was lovely, but it wasn't energizing. And within a month, they had forgotten what the story was and moved on to other things. So the point is to look at a, a story that is drawing you forward. I'm going to come back in a, in a little bit later to some of the brain and neuro, neurological science behind those two concepts. But here's a quote from Yoga Berra. You got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. That's part of the point of finding that future story, a clear story. And when I describe a future story, uh, what I invite people into is to share a story that is vivid, uh, compelling, and uses language that touches upon all of our senses. I want you to describe what the future will taste like. I want you to describe what you can smell in that future. I want you to describe what you can hear within your congregation and within your community. I want you to describe what you can see. I want you to describe what you can touch and feel and sort of grasp and understand about that future. I want to create the story that uses that kind of vivid language that helps you grasp it and, and be drawn into it more deeply. So here's one of the sort of vivid or visual concepts behind this. Uh, the bottom of foundational piece is your why. It is the foundation of what drives you forward. That's the life-giving energy, the values, the beliefs, the, uh, the identity and purpose. Up here in the roof is the what. That's that compelling scene of impact and change and transformation that you will experience. That's where you use that vivid language. They'll experience when you accomplish that sense of vision. Most churches, when they're asking the question, how do we get more people into the pews and uh, people in the pews and pledges in the plate, are gonna spend their time focusing here on the how. How do we do this? Most churches have developed strategic plans and this is the area of strategic plans. If you develop a strategic plan without a future story and without a why, like most strategic plans, it will gather dust on the shelf. It may be brilliant, it may be well done, it will not get you there. So I say before you even think about what you're going to do, how you're gonna implement something, start first at, at a level of prayer and soul at getting to the why. And again, I'm gonna come back to that throughout the presentation. In every one of these principles, there is some common wisdom that reminds us of the dangers. If I encounter a church that has more memories than imagination, 
I know I'm in a place where there's gonna be some challenges. If your future story is how to get back to the church of 1950 or 1960, then you are unlikely to do anything that truly is transformational because you're trying to stay within your comfort zone and within your familiarity. God is always going to call us into a place of imagination and into a place of possibility. So if you're, if you're talking more memories than imagination, it's time to step back and engage the why more deeply, engage in prayer more deeply, and let God begin to shape an imagination that might take you beyond the familiar and beyond the comfort zones into 2060, not the church of 1960. And again, I'm going to touch upon this a little bit later. So again, the first concept, discover your why. Essentially, discovering your why is a spiritual practice and a spiritual activity, as is the future story. It's not just the story that we want for our church 10, 15, 20 years from now. It's the story that we know will delight God 10 years from now, five years from now, 20 years from now. And you can see on the bottom here, again, some of the elements we just talked about. So let me pause the share screen and ask you a question. What of this do you want to bring back to the conversations in your church? I'm going to encourage you to think about that and say it out loud, but also write it down. What part of this is it important for you to bring back to your church and into your church's conversations? That May way. I have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, sure, sure. Um, we have a church that's, uh, well, we've grown a lot over the last seven, eight years because we have a dynamic uh, new pastor with uh, um, Reverend Helen Nablo. So we have a group of folks who've been with the church 30, 40 years, right? And then we have all these new folks who've come in in the last seven, eight years. And I don't think at this point, without a lot of work, we have the same whys. And so I wanted to ask, what's the best way to handle that when you've got two groups, one, love the old, keep the old, and then one, gosh, we see a, an evolution for the future. How do you get to a, a, a why? I love the way you said it, you know, have your congregation get their why. But what happens when you have multiple whys? So multiple, yeah. I, I, I'm in part talking about principles here. I'm going to touch upon and answer that question. But part of the answer to that question is actually going to go in, in some cases beyond this, in part because I have not typically discovered any church that can do this work without an outside individual coming in to accompany them on the journey who can walk them through the kind of conversations that will help my guess is while there may be two different whys, when there's two different whys, there's usually something deeper you haven't gotten to beneath those whys. And as you go to that deeper level, you're gonna to start to find commonality. So the, the trick is how do you engage and how do you find the right sort of conversation that will help to lead you into the deeper exploring. And the language I use is, uh, let's say, you know, we would love to have more young people in our church. Well, why? What will you gain by that? Well, we'd like to have the energy we had in 1960, but why? Why, why was that helpful to you? Why, why did that, where does that connect with you? And to sort of keep asking, what do you gain from that? Why is that important? Until you get to a deeper level of value. And often the deeper level of value is a place where you all share commonality. How you get there, if you stay up at the surface on competing, what you think is competing wise, then you're gonna have competing hows. The question is, how do you keep going deeper into the deeper place? And Mike, this is a theological premise of mine. Um, and I, I'll say it here because I'll say it a couple other places as well. My suspicion, my guess, and my observation is that the deepest level of why will center around Micah 6, 8. What does God require of you? And I don't think it's God's requirement. I think it's God's wisdom that tells us where we most deeply connect with what people long for. So you all have Micah 6, 8 memorized, no doubt, but just in case you don't, what does God require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God? Those are three separate pieces. Do justice means we want to have, we want to have a meaningful impact on the world. I may want to have a meaningful impact by doing this. I might, somebody else may want to have a meaningful impact by doing that, but we both want to have a meaningful impact. That's our common ground. 
we want loving kindness. We want a community we can walk into that feels safe, welcoming. We feel we belong there and we're missed if we're not there. And we can share our love and care with each other. We want that loving kindness, that grounding of community, that grounding and belonging. And then walking humbly with our God, which I think lies beneath both of those, which is I want to walk into a church where in this church, in this community of faith, uh, I am drawn into a deeper relationship with the mystery of the holy, whatever that means to me. Not because someone's trying to tell me what to believe, but because we can share common experiences of God. My guess is that that energy underlies all of the other energies. We express it in different ways. I want to get down there. And it's also my premise that every church will find its own unique way to do loving kindness, to do justice, and to do the walking humbly with God. There's not one universal. The concept's universal, but the approach may differ. And so again, going down deeper will get you there. Often it's going to be helpful to bring an outside person in. There are some resources uh, available, and I'm, I'm going to refer you to your conference staff for that. There may be some uh, particular pieces of, of documentation or worksheets that can help guide you. But uh, you, you'll see again in a few moments why it's often helpful to bring somebody in to help you think through that. Thank you for the question. Uh, and if there's more, please add it. So I'm going back again. You just had another piece of this. What are you bringing back to your church that you want to make sure you include in conversation? Uh, Pam, I, go ahead. I, I just um, had this unbelievable um, recognition that something that I did was courageous, but it didn't have a good why. Um, and that is, there were people who said, well, where will we get our poinsettias? And I want my pecans for Christmas. And so the whole question of what is it that we do in a Christmas bazaar that we can do, um, we started with the what. And we started yeah. crossing off the things we couldn't do because of COVID or because right. we're not gathering. And we, you know, and then, and I thought to myself, but the why, you know, you just, you, you, exactly. you energize me to go to the why. And so um, I have to write something for next week, you know, um, because, you know, I did all the things, I got the funding proposal in, we got, plans in for a silent auction. We got people bringing stuff in. We're gonna take pictures, we're gonna have a silent auction. But the why of it wasn't explained in, until, but because we had gone through all of this and we needed to follow our mission in order to do a fundraising project, we, you know, I should be saying, because our mission is that we need to grow in faith and this will help us grow in faith together. Well, we need to be courageous and seeking justice. We need to do this, not just for ourselves, but for others. And we need to generously care for people. So we need to figure out ways for those people who care about getting their pecans to get them. <laughs> you know, It's like, oh, um, I didn't do it right. So um, I, I, I'm, already writing my, you know, uh, email for tomorrow, for tomorrow to get out on Tuesday, because um, it, we have some people saying, oh, we shouldn't be doing this, we should be worried, you know, we decided to give to a, 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 um, a Wyndham area interfaith ministry because they have set up um, a, a like, a, a fund which is catching people who are in all different areas of um, yep. not just poverty, but people who are caught without jobs, without food, without. So, so that fund is what we're making the money for. Usually we make the money for the church as a whole. And we, at the end of the year, we're always the people that give the money to the church and that saves them from going into deficit, you know, but we made the decision that in order to do fundraising, we have to have a why. So that was there, but it forced us into choosing it, but I haven't told people that's why. Great, that's excellent. So I'm gonna take a moment and, and build upon that for another part of the COVID conversation. We're exhausted by COVID right now, which makes it difficult to even think about these questions. But one of the 
one of the beauties, one of the powers in this moment with this pandemic, when we are forced to do worship and do community and even do some of the traditional things differently, particularly now with the Thanksgiving, Advent, and Christmas season approaching, is to begin asking the question, um, what was essential about all of this? Maybe we can't do the longest night the way we always did the longest night. Maybe we can't do the town's Thanksgiving Eve service the way we always did. Maybe the Christmas Eve and Christmas pageant can't be done the way we always did. But what is essential in that? What is the why beneath those? And once you go down to the why, which you're, which you're wrestling with with the pecans, then you can come back up and say, well, how might we do it differently in this time so that the why is accomplished, not just the tradition? I'm going to move on to just in, to be mindful of time and give you the second concept. Once my computer catches up and lets me go. So the second concept has to do with the church life cycle or the life cycle of any organism or organization. Everything has a place of beginning and a place of ending. And in the current theory of church life cycle, which is drawn upon a theory of organizational life cycles, the observation is that the point from the beginning uh, on the far left side hand side over here of this bell curve over to the end is about 80 years. Now, I, I, I always say most of our churches have been around for longer than 80 years. But if you look back 80 to 100 years prior to this moment, you will see the church operated very differently than it does today. It has gone through a cycle. So this cycle is not simply a one-time event. It just sort of keeps going on and on through time. Uh, and in this cycle, the, the horizontal line here, everything below the horizontal line indicates that the organization is not self-sustaining. It doesn't have enough money or resources or people or energy to, to sustain itself by itself. It needs some energy from the outside. Above the line, it is self-sustaining. It has enough people, enough energy, enough uh, finances, enough resources, enough building for it to be self-sustaining. On the left side of the line here, you have growing in energy. Uh, there are more people coming in. There's more enthusiasm coming in. There's more dreaming happening. There's more imagination happening. There's more programming and relationships are being built on that side of the line. On the other side of the line, all of that is declining. Relationships may still be prevalent towards the end, but you're beginning to have less energy, less people involved, less enthusiasm. Uh, less financial resources, etc. cetera. Uh, there is a Lutheran pastor whose name I have forgotten who uses a, a euphemism for this. He says this first quadrant, here it's called the new church. He calls it the movement quadrant. There's a movement of energy that's building around, around sort of the core set. And that it's not self-sustaining yet, but it's energizing. In the second one, we have the monument quadrant you begin to build a structure around that movement to sustain it and to support it. In the third quadrant, this one called the declining church, we call it the museum quadrant. Uh, and I'll come back to that word in a second. And the last quadrant would be called the morgue quadrant in his particular way of saying. Statistically speaking, about 60% of mainline Protestant churches uh, are in this last quadrant. Uh, primarily because uh, uh, so many of them are drawing upon existing endowments to sustain their current budget, or they may be drawing upon outside renters, to, which is a real problem here in the pandemic time. 80% of churches are somewhere from here on down to, to it. But the key here I want to look at in life cycle is when I walk into a church and listen to them describe what they're looking for, what they want, what they're worried about, Something tells me what happens up here that is the shift from this side of the quadrant of the solvent healthy church to this side of the bell curve where it's in the declining church. This is not a moment in time, it's typically a plateau, but I'm curious if you can name for me what the language is that tells me that the church is on the decline side. What is their focus? Do you know? Managing, managing what's there going go. on. There you go. On this side of the equation, most of the conversation is on maintenance and management of the institution. Most of the conversation and most of the fights have to do with how to maintain the building, 
how to balance the budget, uh, how, we, how we write our bylaws, because bylaws are all about management and control, controlling process, controlling decisions, and how do we, build, how do we get more bodies into our building, back to the you know, pledges and plates. When the language is focused on that, I realize that the church has shifted its focus from the movement energy to the maintenance and management energy. So if I want the church to thrive, I have to shift them back. I have to shift them from our primary focus is to maintain what, we, what, from the, what we're familiar with, getting it back to a missional component, which is based upon the why. Naming and claiming your why is the avenue to shift from maintenance into back into missional. So here's the other language I listen to. Some churches operate as though the pastor is the performer. The congregation is the audience. And God's job is to prompt the pastor. I also have done a workshop on whole church evaluations, and most evaluations are based on the concept of, is the church and the pastor, are the church and the pastor satisfying my needs as a member of the congregation? And we'll ask questions like, do you like the sermon? Do you like the pastoral care? Uh, are you getting enough out of worship? Uh, how do you, what do you think about the church school? It's a, it's a consumer-based concept. And that's a maintenance and a management side conversation. On the missional side, when the church knows its why, it's going to shift all this around. For a healthy, faithful, and effective church, it's the congregation that's the performer. And they're passionately and enthusiastically living its God-given why, stepping outside its comfort zone. The pastor is the prompter and the partner. They come alongside the church. The church is a primary actor, and the pastor's job is not to do it for them or, or give it to them. The pastor's job is to help walk alongside them with the insight and the training the pastor has. And God is the audience. I always say God is the audience from the framework that uh, uh, we walk humbly with God. God is the audience in terms of our praise and, and our worship of God. God is also the audience in terms of the least of these. When Jesus said, um, when you have done this for the least of these, you have done it for me. That's sort of the justice side of things. And I need to add that God is not a passive recipient audience. God actually is an active prompter and partner in the whole thing. God comes alongside the congregation. God comes alongside the pastor in order to help the congregation move into that God-given future. So here's the danger in this concept. If the last one was more memories than imagination, this one is more bibs than aprons. And by that, if you can pick up the, the imagery, do most of your congregation come into a worship or into the church or into your congregation, into your whole church experience with a bib on, I'm here as long as you feed me, or do they come in with an apron on? And my proviso here is, there are times in all of our lives when the world is exhausting, exhausting and wearying and painful, and we need the bib on uh, because we need to have the love of God given to us through our congregation and our pastor, through our scripture and through our worship so that we can be healed and renewed. The problem is when we stop there and don't take the bib off and put the apron on. Most of our time should be spent in the apron world if most of our time is spent in the bib world, we're on the management side, we're not on the missional side. So the second concept here is how do we help the congregation shift its attitude and its thinking and its recognition from being a maintenance-based organization, trying to preserve what was and what, what is dear to us into a missional side. The missional side does not mean you ignore the building. It doesn't mean you ignore the budget. It doesn't mean you ignore the bylaws. It just means that every time you talk about the building and the budget and the bylaws, you always add the comment to what end? Why do we have the budget? Is the budget serving our why? What's the value of our building? Is our building serving our why? Is it serving the way that God is calling us into the future? So those are still important elements. A church can't thrive in that second quadrant if it doesn't have this sort of institution around it, but the institution exists to serve the mission, not to be served by the mission of the congregation. So what is most valuable, most impactful at church at the level of the deepest human needs? This, you know, you're trying to tap into that in this, I'm gonna skip that slide. 
and go back into our sharing. What from this, and, and Sue has written the question here to the side in the chat, and it's gonna be the same for each of these pieces. What from this is important for you to bring back to your congregation? I'll give you just a second to think about that. What from this conversation, from this concept, you wanna make sure you bring back to your congregation in the next week or two or month? And you're welcome to write that in the chat. And I'm gonna say again, the reason I keep pausing is it's, it's our discovery that when we write something down and share it out loud, we are more likely to bring it into reality. So I'm gonna invite you to think about that. What concept do you wanna make sure you bring into the con congregation, uh, into your leadership, into your church in the next week or month? An easy first step. You may not do it all, but an easy first step. This is rich. I'll, I'll bring actually a reinforcement of something that Reverend Jonathan New said uh, in 2016 at a Hampshire Association meeting. He said that mission is from the Greek word missio, meaning send, not convert. And essentially it was about stewardship, but essentially he said, you will become what you are. Which and I've taken that back, and I've, I'm, I'm a drummer when it comes to the message. How well it's being absorbed, I'm not sure. And at great risk, I'll tell it the risque end to the meeting. At great risk, there was discussion about tithe, the equivalent of tithing, and and myself and others are shaking their head. No, we don't do that. <clears throat> And a voice from the other end of the room said, New Englanders talk about sex lives before finances. And it ended the meeting. Thank you. Yep. yep. <laughs> and Kate, I'm seeing your comment in the side as well. Yeah. Part of the challenge of the day yeah, and even the challenge of this workshop in the midst of the pandemic is uh, it, it, in many of our churches, there's already an exhaustion level and energy challenge for our folks. It's magnified in the COVID time. Uh, and so I also want to say to you that there is no quick fix, easy formula. Uh, for, again, I've been in the church growth, church revitalization field for, for a couple of decades. And people are always looking for the quick methodology that will get me from here to there. Real transformation takes time. Um, again, I'm going to come back to this concept later. I keep saying that. But I will say a quick rule of thumb, if I really expect a church to go through transformation and come out on the other side, I'm anticipating a five to 10 year process, not a five to 10 month process. Uh, but it begins by planting seeds. So don't feel the burden that I have to make this happen in the next year or two, but hear the concepts and begin planting those concepts into the heart of the congregation. Uh, like the yeast that you hope will leaven the entire loaf. Uh, think of this as a process in which I wanna plant seeds now, faithfully, spiritually plant seeds now, and keep it present in people's minds so that that transformational work can happen over time not try to force it to happen in a short time frame. <clears throat> I am going to move on to the next concept just to watch the time, but I also want to encourage you to keep looking at the comments here on the side from Pam as well as from Jim. So I'm going to share a little bit of information around change and landscape because this is the context in which we're working. And again, this is about a 10 minute version of what ought to be a two year course. So I'm gonna give you highlights. Uh, and I will also say, we don't know the answers yet. The changing landscape is changing so rapidly around us. And the pandemic is adding a whole new, dim a whole new dimension to that change. That these sort of trend lines that I'm talking about are important to know, but I'm not trying to teach you the concepts. I'm trying to get you to think about what else do I need to know? How do I begin to frame the conversation? Because our church is living in a different landscape now. 
it's living in an even more different landscape now because we're in COVID time. And that landscape is not yet clear. It's still evolving and changing around us. So to take you back to the story of the 1960 church that we are most familiar with, it's a church that I grew up in. And when I was trained as a pastor 40 years, this was a church I was trained to lead. And I was trained to lead it as a professional religious um, leader of a congregation. At, at mostly at a management level, administration level, and leadership level, um, and secondarily at a spiritual level. So here's the church that we are familiar with. The church was the center of social, educational, religious, and political life in the community. Back before we uh, gave up on the Sunday limitations around sports and around economic activity, the church was the place to be on Sunday mornings. Sunday was sacred church only time. Nothing else happened on Sunday mornings. Uh, typically, everyone was a church member. In fact, if you go back 100, 150, 200 years ago, the only way for you to vote and have influence in town politics was to be a member of the parish, a member of the church. You also typically had to be white and male and a landowner. When you moved into a community, joining a church was one of your first actions, because that is not only how you built your social network, it's also how you built your business network. Uh, it was important to have relationships in the community to, in order to carry, carry out and conduct your business. And it was a place in which we got to know each other. Uh, church activities were typically community activities. Everybody stopped everything to come to the church bazaar or they stopped everything to come to worship or any sort of social or fellowship event. None of those is true anymore. Let me say that again. None of those points is true anymore. And it's not coming back. For a number of years, we fought about Sunday mornings. Can we change our community so that they stop doing sports on Sunday mornings? I'm going to come to it in a second for one of the reasons why, that, well, the reason that doesn't happen is because on Sunday morning, maybe only 1% of the population may be involved in your particular church. And the, the entire community is not going to shift its life around a small percentage. Come back to that. In the new world, one of the things we're encountering is a loss of faith and trust in institutions. This is in general. There is a loss of faith and trust in authority. Uh, you heard a little bit of that from the speaker this morning at worship. There's a loss of faith and trust in experts. Uh, this particular election cycle with this language around fake news and the language around the echo chambers of social media like Facebook uh, it is teaching people that we can't trust the people who claim to be experts out there. All of Christianity is lumped together. Uh, you may see stories on the news of extreme behaviors amongst uh, people of faith. Uh, and it may not only be Christians, it may be all religion. But in the world today, many people are lumping all Christian churches and all religious institutions in, into the same sort of categories based on that. All religions lump together. They aren't thinking about church at all. We used to presume that if I could hang a sign out in front of my church, uh, people would drive by and say, oh, that's really cool. I want to go to that church. Uh, the reality is most people drive by the church and don't even see the church, don't even think about the church, uh, and are not likely to see or care about the signage out front. I don't want to eliminate that. I don't want to say that's not a valuable tool to go forward with. But I don't want you to presume that people are watching church the same way that we are thinking of watching church because you grew up in church. It's not in their minds the same way. So uh, I often will quote um, some statistics, and I want to be cautious here that the statistics keep changing. So I'm going to give you some generalized language here, uh, and I'll point you to some of the resources on this. But the numbers themselves are, are in shift, and it depends upon which particular research you look at. With that caveat in mind, back in 1962, a survey was done of religious in this country. Three pr uh, primary questions were asked. Do you believe in God? Uh, do you have a regular prayer life? And do you affiliate or attend church? Back in 1962, about 95% of the people said they believe in God. About 80, 90, 95% said we have a regular prayer life. We pray roughly once a week uh, or a, a little bit more often than that, perhaps. 
Um, and most all of them, 90, 95% said they had some connection or affiliation with a church or religious institution of some kind. They were members somewhere or they thought of something as their home church. We have seen the decline of church, particularly mainline white Protestant churches. Not all churches have been in decline, but particularly main, mainline white Protestant churches. And for a while, the more evangelical churches were growing, but they've plateaued and begun to shift as well. So we began to ask the questions again. Well, what's happening in our world? Do you still believe in God? Do you still pray regularly? And do you affiliate with the church? So in 1962, about 95% of the people said they believed in God. What percentage of people today claim to believe in God? Do you know? Shout it out. Unmute yourselves and shout it out. No idea. Depending, go ahead. 70%? So it will depend on the way the question is asked. If they think by God, you're asking, do you believe in the God that the church has tried to promote? It goes down. But if you simply ask the question, do you believe there's something out there that can relate to, it's still around 95%. A 90, 90 percent. There's still a very high percentage of people that have a belief in the reality of something beyond them. Back in 1962, uh, about 90, 80, 90 percent of the people prayed regularly, or roughly once a week. What percentage of people have a spiritual practice on a regular basis today? Again, I'll say it's about 80 or 95. That that has not changed. So the belief in God has stayed fairly consistent in some form of spiritual practice that connects us with something outside of ourselves has remained somewhat consistent. Our definitions have changed, but the longing has not shifted. But what percent of people on any given weekend are going to attend a service of worship in their community, in some religious institution? What percentage would you say? 10%? Some statistics put it at, at around 8 to 17%. Wow. Um, some of the research will indicate 21 to 41%. However, when you actually look at church attendance numbers that are counted, it's not that high. So some people report going to church who apparently never showed up in the building. But then we went back and began to ask them, so why don't you come to church? You know, we, you know those who answered would say to us because they believe churches are hypocritical. They say one thing, but their behavior is very different. They're concerned that churches are going to impose doctrines and morals. If I walk into your building, you're going to force me to believe and behave the way you believe and you behave. I don't want that anymore. I'm done with that. Uh, they believe churches are meddling in politics. I want to be cautious here. They are longing for churches to be actively involved in making a difference in the world. And we'll see a little bit later some of the focal points of that. They don't want churches trying to force their opinions, their doctrine, and their morals into the law of the land. They don't want people being partisan, but they want people being political. And there's a difference between those two. They don't want people forcing bipartisan uh, politics, doctrines, and morals, but they do want churches in political ways changing the world for the better. Uh, they are under the impression that churches are vitriolic and toxic, particularly on moral issues, particularly on issues like uh, same gender, uh, homosexuality, uh, and abortion. They may be in different places themselves on what they believe about that, but they are concerned that the church in its behavior is vitriolic and toxic, and they are done with that, and therefore done with church. But mostly they describe that churches feel out of touch with the world that they live in and the concerns they have and that churches are boring. That's the primary thought. I would add to that the language of they think churches are simply irrelevant is one of the most common phrases. Now, here's what people are looking for, but my caution here is don't take this as a <coughs> to do. Remember, it's not what you do that matters, it's why you do it. So don't take this as a prescription for how to succeed. What they're looking for is that doing justice, loving kindness, walk humbly. we talked about before. They're looking for a place where they can have conversation and dialogue, not a talking head telling them what they should believe. They want to be engaged in conversation. 
They want a place that accepts them in where they can belong for who they are. I talked about that before as well. And here's the place where they're particularly looking for the church to have an impact. They're looking for a more peaceful, less violent, less dangerous world. They're looking for a place where there is not such a huge gap between wealth and poverty. They're looking for a place where the dignity of people, as people are who they are in their beliefs, in their lifestyle, uh, it can be, I'm not sure, embraced, but can be accepted and, and, and received more fully. And they're looking for a place that cares about a more sustainable planet uh, around them. Those are, those are areas in which they have the greatest concern. And they're looking for a place that will help them experience a mystical encounter with the holy, not only in the building, but also outside in the sacred world. And finally, this is an interesting piece. For many years in the whole church growth movement, we all said, you know, abandon your traditional way of church, start doing contemporary worship. And then we discovered that the difference between tradition and traditionalism, I have this quote that came from somebody, I can't remember who it was, but the person said, tradition is the living faith of dead people and traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. See the difference. Traditionalism means we've always done it that way. And it has to do with maintenance of what is familiar and comfortable. Tradition has to do with people who have walked a journey of faith, struggled with life, encountered God, experienced the holy and the power of the holy to transform and heal and have passed on their learnings to others. Tradition is a living faith of dead people. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. People are longing for the tradition because it is the collective wisdom of generations before us who have wrestled in life and encountered a God who has been a powerful presence for them. They're longing for those stories uh, that we can pass on from previous generations and our own stories of that encounter with God. They're longing for that. That doesn't mean you abandon tradition or that you abandon contemporary. It means you go to authentic within both of those. When we talk about the number of people showing up in church on Sunday mornings, a uh, number of people affiliated with church, it is also interesting to note that there's a trend difference that's changing. <clears throat> These are the six different generations. There's actually seven now who could all be in the building at the same time if they actually all came to church. And you'll see that each successive generation is less likely to affiliate with the church. So it's not simply that we're down to 21 or 41 percent who claim an affiliation with church. It's that that 21 to 41 percent is primarily an older generation. Uh, and based upon that, if that older generation ages out of life and church, there's not a lot of people coming in behind them because the people behind them have lived in a different world and are looking for a different experience we just talked about with God. We're also seeing a dramatic shift in the demographics of this country. And again, most of what we know as mainline Protestant worship uh, and even mainline Catholic church in this country is based upon a culture that evolved out of the white dominant culture. And as we have an increasingly diverse culture around us, the generations growing up are growing up in a different diversity of culture than the generations that crafted the church. We go back to this slide. The church was built by and for this upper generation, the builders, the silence, and the baby boomers. And it, it operates out of the mindset and the framework that they are most familiar with. The generations below this line have experienced a different world. And if the church doesn't express that different world they've grown up in, which is this world of diversity, along with others, then they're unlikely to find the church as relevant or meaningful in their lives. One more example of that, if you take out English and Spanish, these are the different languages which are the third most prominent language in each of these regions. And you can see that diversity and we'll come back to it later. So here's the danger. A favorite quote of mine, uh, it's attributed to Einstein. He never actually said this, but he taught this concept all the time. No problem can be solved out of the same level of consciousness that created it. So when a church comes to me and says, what do we have to do to get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate? One of the dangers is if they can only view the world through one level of consciousness, the one they grew up in, they may not be able to solve that problem. 
because no problem can be solved out of the same level of consciousness that created that problem. So here's the third concept. It is a different world, and you've just got a snapshot of it in these moments. People are leaving institutional religion, but God is active in the world, and people are actively looking for God, or at least the spiritual. We use that phrase, spiritual but not religious. And this comes from a book by Todd Bolsinger called Canoeing the Mountains. Uh, it's a great sort of view. Again, it comes out of the white dominant culture perspective, but it still has some great wisdom in it. The road ahead for the church will not look like the road behind. The church of 2060 will not resemble the church of 1960. And that would have been true anyways, but it's even more true because of this changing landscape that we're now in in our world. It is a time of profound change. Phyllis Tickle in her book, The Great Emergence, will say, once every 500 years, we have a major shift, and we're in that major shift. We won't see the end of it for a, a decades, if not a century, but we're in that shift. And this pandemic of COVID has accelerated that shift for all of us. Okay, once again, a lot of stuff coming your way. I'm watching the time, and I know there have been some comments off here to the side, just making sure that we pause for a second, because before I go on, I want to have a moment to pause and let some of this settle in. And I'm going to give us a five minute break. And in that five minute break, I'm going to invite you to write something down, one takeaway from that last section that either you want to explore more or you want to bring into your congregation. So in the next five minutes, I invite you to do a takeaway, write it down for you, hold on to it, and then get up and stretch, get a cup of coffee, do something to kind of get yourself moving again. We'll come back to the next two concepts. I will see you. I'll start talking again at about 1127. Thanks. So folks, if you are joining this and watching this later as a recording, I actually paused the recording during that break. Uh, so you wouldn't be sitting here watching five minutes of break. But if you are watching the recording, I would encourage you to pause the recording now and give yourselves that five minute break just to kind of let your brain settle in just a little bit. So folks, welcome back. Um, I'm going to keep moving on with this just because I want to get through the material and then come back and have a little chance to do a little processing and thinking around it. Because there are two more concepts to go and this next one is uh, a couple of your questions have been around methodology. How do you get from here to there? Again, this is the concept here by a person named Otto Scharmer, who has developed what he calls Theory U, based upon the U shape that you're looking at on the screen. Uh, his book is Theory U, A Model of Transformational Change. You can also find a lot of his work if you were to uh, Google Otto Scharmer or Theory U. There are some very good videos on this content. I would also point you to a book by Susan Beaumont, um, and Sue, I'm going to ask you to look it up. You may know Susan better. I think it is um, How to Leave When You Don't Know Where You're Going, I believe is the title of the book. Susan Beaumont, B-A-U-M-O-N-T. And she has a nice section in there on the Theory U concept. While you may not be familiar with the concept, um, I say this is nothing more than the wilderness story. The concept of Theory U was embodied in the story of the Exodus. We were slaves once in Egypt, and God led us into the promised land. We know that metaphoric concept. But I like to point out to folks that the distance on this map between Egypt and the eventual promised land in which they settled is about four hours by a jet. And it might be four days by a car, if even that long. And it might be four months if you're using the old wagon train caravan or a camel caravan of that day. And yet it took them 40 years in the wilderness. And the reason for 40 years in the wilderness is because this is not simply getting to the destination. It is getting into and through the journey. 
that there's something about the journey that requires time. It's why I said you can't do transformational visioning or, or really bring your church into a place of vitality, vitality in five to 10 months. You better plan on five to 10 years. And I will say, and once you get there, I'll, I'll come back to this anyways. I don't want to say it just yet. Uh, once you get there, there's more work to be done. Most of us live in what we call our comfort zone, our status quo, the place that is familiar, the place that is safe, the place where we know the rules, the place that cares for us and feeds us, uh, gives us a place of satisfaction, comfort, and security. Uh, it is not easy to leave that, uh, that place of security. In the story of Exodus, that status quo was slavery in Egypt. But there were times in the wilderness where they wanted to go back to the slavery in Egypt because it had security and stability and predictability and familiarity. It is very difficult to get off status quo. So since you've listened this far, let me share with you a, a relatively scary statistic. It, the studies have been done around people making changes, and I believe this comes from the medical world, where they did some research on people who had had a heart attack. And they were told by their doctor that if you want to live, if you want to avoid another heart attack, you have to change your lifestyle. Eat less salt, eat less fat, eat a healthy diet, get out there and get some exercise, uh, take care of your life, stop smoking, et cetera. They found that nine out of 10 people could not sustain that change. The threat of death was not enough to get them to make the kind of changes that would preserve and save their lives, nine out of 10. It is very difficult for an organization to go through a substantial change. Theory U helps understand not only why it's difficult, but how to get beyond that difficulty. So the first thing that had to happen in the story of, of Exodus was the 10 plagues. I, don't, I think that if God had, I, the 10 plagues in the Bible describe what it was required to force the powers of Egypt to let the people of Israel go. My guess is it was equally required to have the 10 plagues in order for the people of Israel to be willing to step out into the wilderness. There has to be some sort of crisis or energy that will allow people to say, we need to leave the status quo. In that life cycle theory, that energy typically comes to, to us as conference staff when they suddenly realize we have about three to five years left in our endowments before we burn through the principal and can no longer sustain our budget. Please help us. Um, if you're not in, the, and that is a compelling place, but it typically drives us to quick solutions. That's why for me, this red circle, this place of change has to do with reconnecting with your why and then developing that compelling future story from it because it takes a great deal of energy to get past this place of status quo, to break out of the comfort zone and get past the resistance. In theory, you, the observation by Otto Sharma and others is most people, when they hit that place of crisis where the red circle is here, try to solve the problem. What do we have to do to get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate? They, they focus on the how to do this, and they, they create a strategic plan, all of which comes out of the head as, as a strategy. And in the head, they will attempt to cross the wilderness quickly and painlessly, and they will not succeed. The work of transformational change, which is really the work that God is always calling us to, is to go from our head into the place of heart where we begin to look at, own, and name the feelings not only of what we hope for and what we need and long for, but also the feelings of grief and shame and anger and fear that come with all of that, the, the sense of loss. I'm talking a bit more about that. You have to go into the heart and the emotions that are evoked by change before you can get to the deeper level, which is the soul level, the level where we encounter God and let God show to us the future. It was Mark Twain who said, the only human being that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. That's the uncomfortable piece. And naming that helps us say, we can't just solve this problem. We have to begin looking at, at the heart and at the soul. And this is the challenging piece that I find in transformational visioning. I will also say it's the challenging piece about faith formation and about discipleship. 
I think where God is most active is in what Susan Beaumont and others will call liminal space, what I will call the wilderness wanderings. That is a place where you sit with the heart and the uncomfortableness, and you sit with the soul with complete openness and surrender to God. It is the most uncomfortable place for human beings and human organizations to be. And if we don't know how to live in that place, our tendency will either be to rush forward into the future or rush back into the familiar, neither of which will get us there. So part of the work is learning how to live in this space. I'll skip that piece. I'll come back to this is the concept of, of, of the diffusion of innovation model. Um, I find there's not enough time to talk about this except to briefly say some people will jump into the wilderness quickly, some will follow the early jumpers, some will take a long time before they're willing, they're going to watch everybody else go out first before they jump in. Some people are going to watch everybody else first and there are some people who just aren't ever going to go there. I find in churches that the people that rule the process are the laggards because that's what happens when you stay in your head. And you try to keep everybody happy because you're afraid that if we don't keep people happy, they'll leave. If we don't keep people satisfied, they'll leave. And so we reduce all of our activity to that which keeps the laggards happy. I'm being a little bit too crass here, a little bit too, too um, challenging. I'm going to come back to the concept in a second because I don't want to blame the laggards for the lack of energy. And I don't want to label people as laggards. Neither of those is helpful. Because in the laggards is still a deep longing for something different. They just may have a higher level of need or fear. So the work is not to blame them. The work is how do you work as a whole to move you forward, which comes to this slide. I have not yet discovered any place that defies this. All transformation in the organization and the church and the institution begins with the transformation of the leaders. I'm not going to focus on the resistors initially. I'm going to focus on getting leaders who are prepared to walk into the wilderness and hold that uncomfortable space with the resources of God, the resources of each other, and the resources of good knowledge, soul, heart, and head. They have to be there before everybody else can be there. And the caution is, uh, which I've encountered and actually done myself, um, it's another one of my favorite quotes, when you have a transformational leaders, you have to caution them, don't get so far ahead of the troops, you start looking like the enemy. There's a fine line between getting so excited about the compelling story and so excited about the why, you get so far ahead of everybody else that they can't come with you and they start shooting at you. Uh, you become the lightning rod for them. You need to both be transformed and hold that space. This is not an easy place and you're not gonna learn it here in this webinar. I will refer you back to the book by Susan Beaumont and there's some others we can lead you to. And again, say, if you wanna engage this process, have a conversation with your conference staff and help them lead you into it. Because in truth, transformation will not happen unless the leaders are themselves first transformed. That includes the pastor, the staff, and key leadership in the church that everybody can look to and trust and respect. So here's the danger in this. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the question you asked earlier about the two different whys. Change evokes resistance. That's just normative. And resistance is uh, exhibited in typically three different categories, either active oppositional rebellion, or passive aggressive sabotage or withdrawal. And I'm gonna watch for all three of those, not as things to avoid, but as indicators that we've engaged something because resistance is almost always, I was gonna say always, resistance is almost always the fear and the grief of losing something. So back to the question about competing whys. I didn't wanna jump into this at that point, but I'm gonna jump into it here. When you have competing whys, you only need to get below the deeper needs. You have to begin to talk about the fears and the grief. I have this why because it takes me someplace that satisfies me. And if I haven't dealt with and helped the congregation and, and membership deal with their place of grief and fear and loss, then I'm going to stay in the head where we'll fight. And I won't get into the heart that it takes me down into the soul. And so, it's not as simple as naming this, but at some point you have to name 
that if we're going through change, there's going to be resistance. That resistance is not curmudgeons and laggards. It's people with, with legitimate fear and legitimate grief that if we don't deal with that, name it, own it, pray for it, and hold it, we're not likely to get through change. We're likely to get into conflict. And here's the other piece that's interesting in the brain neurology. We, uh, you all know, we have different layers of our brain from a primitive layer to, to the more uh, cognitive and developed brain layers, but we are driven by the primitive layers. Uh, the, the limbic brain, the, the reptilian brain has different kind of names behind it. That brain had to learn that you're either the diner or the dinner. You're either the, you're either the, the predator or the prey. And you learn very quickly that if danger comes and you don't avoid that danger, you're going to be dead. And if you avoid the danger, you've learned to avoid it in the future. You're driven by fear. Fear in the human psyche and the human energy as a motivator of behavior is five times more powerful than any other emotion in our body, which is why in this current election cycle and every election cycle, people are preaching fear. They want to change, they want to, they want to motivate you to vote and behave a certain way, and they use fear as the tactic because they know fear is the most powerful motivator of human beings. If you don't name and deal with the fear and bring that into the conversation, which is a spiritual task, you are unlikely to get through transformation, which brings you to this point. Conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. So when I work with a, a congregation in transformational visioning, one of the things I encourage them to read is a book called um, Crucial Conversations. It's written by a number of people based on 25 years of research in the business world, uh, looking at the ways people could engage in conversation uh, when they have conflict that allows conflict to be transformative and resilient as opposed to destructive. Uh, combat is optional, conflict is inevitable. If you wanna go through deep change, you wanna bring in or work with some of the elements of how do we do conflict well in a congregation? Because actually conflict is one of the energies that can evoke transformation or destroy transformation. You wanna be able to have transformed leaders who know how to recognize conflict, rebellion, sabotage, withdrawal, uh, and go beneath it into the place of fear, grief, and loss so that we're not driven by behaviors that come out of fear. So this wraps all the different concepts together into one uh, lovely image, um, which I'm sure as time evolves will itself change. Here's the old model. For 30 or 40 years, uh, in when I've done work in church growth, the primary focus of church growth has been the attraction model. How do we get more people in the pews and places? We had some great things, and they're still great ideas for getting people to come into the church, but they fail because they don't do the transformational work. So we begin to see decline, and we try to figure out what do we have to do to get more people in the pews and places to play good advertising, good networking in the community, get out and form relationships, uh, do good advertising, good, do the good programs that get people to come your way. All of that typically does not succeed because it's driven from the wrong questions. And the further down you are in decline, the harder the work is to change things around if your only basis is a transformational model. This model is no easier than that. It is recognition that at some point, we're not gonna go back we're going to take a break, make a break from where we're at. We're going to leave Egypt. We're going to engage in the process that creates both conflict and opportunity in order to take us deeply into our hearts and our souls where God can help us see God's future. It is a spiritual transformational process. And somewhere in here, I'm looking for a slide I didn't see yet. It will come here. So visioning is a spiritual transformational practice. It's not a strategic plan. It's not about problem solving. You can't do surface tinkering or you can't figure out the right methodology, the right program. You have to begin by bringing you and the congregation to a place of God to this place. How do you get to the place where we are genuinely and authentically opening ourselves to holy indifference to the outcome? I don't care where the church goes. I do care. That's not, I'm not eliminating that care. But I'm, I, what I want to get to is a future church that delights God, not a future church that delights me. Getting the congregation to that place is the work of theory use, the work of transformation. It's the work of going from head to heart to soul. And it's also true in every faith tradition in the world. In our primary prayer, we have the phrase, thy will be done. 
And that is the essence of holy indifference to outcome. The Buddhist tradition will talk about um, surrender or, or, or other traditions talk about sacrifice. AA says, let go and let God. It's, it's in all those different concepts and it is one of the most difficult concepts for us as humans to get to. It is also the heart of our faith, holy indifference to outcome. All right, you have received yet another massive dose of information. Let me pause and let's sort of integrate some of that thinking collectively together. What are you hearing? What are you thinking? What are you wrestling with? And thank you, uh, Sue, for capturing the Sue Beaumont book. It's there in the chat room if you haven't seen it yet. Takeaways from this that you want to bring forward. Or are you all Zoom exhausted? Or are you all like sort of, I'm pro I can, it looks like you're processing more than you're exhausted. Nell, go ahead. Um, and, and maybe this gets back to the uh, earlier question. Uh, first, I want to say this is so wonderful to hear because I'm, I'm, I've got new ears. I have new eyes. Um, I feel like in some ways our church is either in an interim time or all of a sudden we're a new church start. And my takeaway is the importance of sharing this information again with our people because we're not the same people we were last year and we're not the same people we are you know right. five years ago um i have we also in this covid period and here's something that's uh, amazing to me we've had 11 new people join our church during this covid period um and uh so the hunger for meeting making is still there and i think where i have this information is convicting me <laughs> that I need to share this again. This is not a one and done. This is information, um, of, uh, not just information, but this is a, a good stuff that needs to be uh, reminded to people. It's the same way that we go through the lectionary, you know, every three year cycles, we tell those stories over and over again uh, because we're different people. So that's my takeaway and I'm very excited as I'm always excited when I'm hearing about this, but very excited to share that with my folks again. And again, I'll reinforce, you know, new ears, new eyes. That's constantly who we are. We are constantly learning and growing. Um, you use the language of interim. Again, I grew up in a world where the interim was, this is another one of those cute metaphors. They were the cheese between two slices of bread. And we endured the interim in order to get back to the bread. Uh, the reality, and, and I've also heard people say, I'm a pastor in an unintentional interim. But I, I would like to change that concept to say, again, if, if you look at that liminal space in the middle of the theory you, we are all interims. And even the interim language is not the appropriate language. This era is particularly challenging, both pandemic era and this cycle and in the, in the global change in religion. Uh, if we think that we can be a settled pastor or a settled church, we are failing to understand what the gospel has taught us and failing to understand what God has taught us. Uh, God is more prevalent in the wilderness than either Egypt or the promised land. And it was really only about one generation into the promised land became, before it became its own new Egypt, stuck in its ways and had to be pulled out again. God is always calling us into that place in the wilderness because it's the only place where we deeply learn how to trust God. But we as human beings want stability. And so those are always going to be intention. So taking the material learning it over and over and over again is, is a lifelong journey for all of us. And I think right now the Holy Spirit is profoundly calling our church to wake up in a new way to being a wilderness people uh, and not a promised land people. And, and, and it's not what we've been taught, it's not what we've learned, it's not what we've thought about, uh, and yet it is what God calls us to. Yes, I, Sue, I see the concept of fertilizer that often needs to be reapplied to our growing and changing churches over and over and over again. All right, I'm gonna move on uh, because I, I like the fun of this next piece. So this is a concept, uh, I was gonna say it's mine, but it's not, by mine, none of this material is really mine. All this material is a compilation of lots and lots of things pulled together. But I like to use this particular construct that right now our churches are have three paths that lie ahead for them. 
These are three alternative choices, even though the numbers go from two to 2.6 to 3.0, this is not a linear progression. It's three distinct choices or three distinct categories of church of choices of churches. You can either remain as you are, which is church 2.0. And if those current statistics are accurate, that the primary membership particularly in the mainline Protestant and some of the main the mainline traditions all across. Um, let me simply ask this out loud. What's the average age in a mainline Protestant church? Do you know? 60. I've been saying 65 for five years, which tells me the math has changed. It's probably close to 70. Yeah, I remember from that chart where the unaffiliated folks that most of the above the line are were affiliated with the church. Most of church point two point oh is an older generation. They're not drawing in younger generations for all the reasons we've talked about. They are still doing faithful and good work. It's not as though there's something wrong with them. It's not that 2.0 is not faithful. It's just that 2.0 has about 20 to 25 years left before there's either not enough people or not enough energy to sustain it or not enough money to sustain it either. 2.6 is a church that has gone through that process of transformational change and has discovered a new way of being church within the resources that they currently have. And then church 3.0, which is what's described in the book Weird Church and a few others uh, out there, they're doing some work on this. Um, is the church where the Holy Spirit is moving in the world and gathering people together. What I would call church, they would never call it church. They just saying we're having a we're having a fellowship event or and it's spiritual or it's meaningful. They use a lot of different terms that are not our classical language, but are the same thing as our classical concepts. These are new ways in which the Holy Spirit is bringing together communities of people, communities of faith all over the world around us. Um, our work is to make is to choose a difference. And here are the markers of those three different categories. So Church 2.0, and this is a document you'll find on the website. The primary focus in Church 2.0 is satisfying its membership and maintaining the organization, the institution, the building, all those things we talked about. In Church 2.0, they still view the pastor as a performer. If they fail to perform the right way and satisfy the congregation or annoy the congregation, we have to replace them. Pastor spends 100% of their time serving the congregation. That's the expectation. Don't be strict on the numbers here. I'm just trying to get the concept across. The bulk of the time for the pastor is expected to be spent with the congregation. 2.0 has more memories than imagination. They want to go back to the heyday of the church, which is when the baby boomers brought their kids to church back in the 60s. Uh, budget cuts, when budget cuts come, which they inevitably will come, typically hit mission and program first. Uh, before they tackle staff and building. But typically you'll start seeing a reduction of programs, re reduction of mission outreach. Vision, if there is one, is a strategic plan focused on what do we have to do to get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate. And the maintenance, preservation, protection of the institution is prominent in their conversations and in their struggles, in their wrestling. Church 2.6. Their primary focus is on fulfilling God's vision. They know their why and they have a compelling future story. Faith formation is for all ages and it's intentional. And, and again, don't quote me on numbers, but I'm trying to say is that the majority of people in the congregation are actively and intentionally engaged in some form of spiritual practice. They are opening their hearts to God in such a way that they, they can get to that place of holy indifference to outcome. The pastor spends half their time with the church and half the time out in the community getting to know what the Holy Spirit might be calling the church into the community. Uh, and the pastor is leading the way. They're not doing that work for the church. They're doing that work with the church. So 50% of the leadership's time is likely to be spent in a community, forming networks, relationships, partnerships, listening and learning from the, from the community. The building, the budget and the bylaws are still important functions, but they are designed to be aligned to accomplish the vision. We are maintaining the building in order that the building can be used in this way to accomplish our vision. Our, 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 our vision. We are looking for our budget and maybe we're making some fiscal sacrifices in order for us 
to accomplish our vision. Congregation understands that it is the performer carrying out God's will, and success is not measured by numbers. It's not measured by people in the pews and pledges in the plate. Success is measured by the impact the church has on its memberships, whose lives are being transformed, and on the community where they're making a meaningful difference in the world. They're looking at their success uh, and they're measuring their success as church leaders, as church members, and as staff based upon impact. And they are intentionally forming community partnerships. We talk about covenant partnerships uh, and networks that help them uh, live into and accomplish their vision. Then you have church 3.0. Again, the primary focus is on encountering God in new ways in the world. Uh, and in doing so, all the people are there because encountering God, faith formation, they wouldn't use the language of faith formation, but they would lose the language of spiritual impact, spiritual growth, spiritual, uh, spiritual learning. Pastor spends very little time with the congregation and most of the time out in the community embodying, living, and learning around their mission and their why. The budget's growing because more people are coming in with their energy and resources to help the congregation meet its why. The congregation intentionally remains fluid and adaptable. Uh, we haven't done it that way is rarely heard uh, in this congregation. Uh, and if it is, it's also heard with a caveat, but maybe there's a new way to do this. We've always done it this way, but maybe we, there's a new way. Maybe God is leading us somewhere else. Again, success is measured by impact, not numbers. And again, Church Point 3.0 is birthed out of its why, uh, coming with that energy. And often Church 3.0 is not building centered. It could be, but it's not focused on a building and a location. Um, the building may be a means to an end, but it's not their focal point. Here's the danger. <clears throat> Listen for this concept. If we or the right pastor can just try harder, we can figure out how to get more people in the pews and pledges in the plate. Uh, but there must be a successful model out there somewhere. That tells me I'm in 2.0 thinking uh, in the concept, institutional maintenance thinking. So again, the fifth concept, there are three choices. Each is faithful in its own way and each will have a predictable end point to it, but each can be faithful. I wanna say this again, for some churches, it is so difficult to make change that the most faithful thing may be not to annoy the congregation, but to make sure that you are faithfully living within the way in which you're living now. It may be that church bazaars still are important. They could be. They could be very, very important. It could be that the pageant, the way we've always done it, is important to us because it feeds our soul. They're not likely to get you into a long-term future, but, but, I, but if that's okay. None of the churches that Paul planted exist today. And the presumption that we have to exist forever is not faithful to God. That comes out of human need and human ego. God is going to make sure the body of Christ lives on forever. That's, that's the Holy Spirit's power in our world. And it doesn't mean that every church has to live on forever. And there may be many points in which the most faithful thing for a church to do is to let go of its life in order for God to birth and resurrect something new. That's part of who we are in our story with Jesus, a death and resurrection people. It's okay to be faithful in what you're familiar with and let it go at its end. And I will say one question to ask is, is it more faithful to burn through your endowments until you're gone or go now and release the endowments to do some faithful work to God into the future? That may be one of the questions that we're struggling with in, in 2.0. All of this is faith, facing faithful choices to serve God faithfully as best we know God in our way forward. And God is generous, and God is abundant, and God is loving, and God is compassionate, and God is understanding. If we give our hearts to God, God will help to guide us. I'm starting to preach now. I'm going to stop. And before I go to this, I think I want to show, I do want to show this. So if you're to Google the backwards bicycle and there it is right on the thank you, Sue, you're awesome. 
Uh, if you want to find that video clip, you can you can download or grab that right now and, <clears throat> and pull it aside. It's a great one to look at. So it really kind of summarizes all the concepts we're looking at here. That uh, if you're trying to engage in transformational work as a church, and if you really if you're looking to be faithful before God, uh, you're looking to develop that spiritual plasticity that openness to the spirit that can take us out of Egypt, not into the promised land, but deeply into the wilderness where spiritual plasticity is learned and enables us to become a more faithful people before God. It's a lovely theological concept. The process for doing that is outlined in all the language around finding your why, making that shift from maintenance back into the missional, engaging in a process like theory U that takes you into that that change into the future and then looking out beyond yourselves into a changing world around you that can both guide how you go into the future and help you understand to go more deeply into yourselves that work is a transformational work that i'm going to invite you into and i'm going to think i'm going to show you one more slide and then we'll bring this to uh, closing conversation God is alive in 2050, waiting for us in our future, a future of beautiful alliances. This comes from uh, the book, Weird Church. And here's, here's uh, one of my other little sort of adjustments to the world. I have that book on my Kindle. I have no idea what page this is on. I can tell you it's on Kindle location 397 on my iPad. It may or may not be the same location on yours. That's the best I can do for a reference point on this. God is already alive in 2050, waiting for us in our future of Kindles and not necessarily always on paper, a future of beautiful alliances beyond our foggiest imagination. Does your church have the spiritual plasticity to journey, to get there outside of your comfort zones and familiarity? And here's my story. So I don't know if the story happened exactly this way. Uh, I'm not even sure the story is true but I believe there is truth in the story. So the story is told of a zoo somewhere that had a, a famous gorilla. Uh, and it was the, one of the key attractions for this particular zoo. And people would come from all over the area and even the world to come and see this particular gorilla. But one day, the zookeeper arrived early in the morning only to discover that the gorilla had died overnight at old age and just simply passed away. But they had this huge contingent of dignitaries coming that day and they couldn't open the zoo without the gorilla. So very quickly, they found one of their employees and asked the employee to throw on a gorilla suit and hop into the gorilla cage and start acting like the gorilla, which that person did. They're paying him, so he's happy to do it. He jumped in, he's beginning to hop around, he's doing all what, what he thinks makes him look like a gorilla. He's hopping around in this, in, inside the cage until he comes across one of the walls on the edge of the cage. And so it's a wall about, about two or three feet high. He hits the wall walking backwards, not paying attention, and he falls over into the neighboring cage, the neighboring enclosure, which is the lion enclosure. And he sees the lion from a distance come bounding towards him and he panics. He stands up and he starts shouting, somebody save me, somebody save me, the lion's going to eat me. Somebody. And the lion comes bounding over and people are looking at it, they're, they're gasping in fear, they realize what's going on. The lion jumps up on top of him, pins him down and says, shut up or you'll get us both fired. <laughs> the point is... You can't put on a gorilla suit and pretend to be something you're not. If you're going to move into God's future, you have to be the church in the person that God has designed you to be that is found in your why. It is found in that wilderness journey. It is found in knowing that that energy is what will lead you into God's missional future, a story that you can begin to wrap yourselves around. You cannot focus on your what. You cannot put on a gorilla suit. Um, the rest of this presentation, which I'm not going to get to, but it will be, uh, it's on the website, is a description of stories of churches uh, and, and groups of people who have come together in new and in novel ways. You can't look at that and say, oh, let's try this. You have to begin the journey between you and God at the soul level, beneath the heart and beneath the head, where you find out who God has designed and created and called you into being, not the gorilla suit on the outside. I'm going to end the presentation there. Uh, and invite us into a time of conversation, the time that we have remaining. Mm -hmm.